Good morning, y'all. We will get started at noon. So thanks for coming in. I appreciate it. Our special guest will hopefully be arriving soon. Um, can't wait for you to meet her. So we will be starting up very shortly. Hey, hey, Dr. Mason. I think you're muted. Has our speaker gotten on yet? Not. Okay. I told the um, um, other principals that I will be getting onto theirs a few minutes late. Okay. I see Karen with the Y, I see her name. Can you hear me? We can. I was saying, I was talking and I was saying, I can't start my video because the host has stopped it. So I don't know if you guys don't want me to have video either. <laughs> Let 
Lord. It's okay, Jason. These, I don't know why that you're not allowed to, which is weird. Yeah, I got a little message that popped up when I tried to activate it. Hi, Kelly. <laughs> Doctor, Hi, I'm how, sorry. How, Doctor, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> Has good. he blocked you? Is he blocked you from being able to show your face? He has. It He's wasn't sorry. me, I promise. <laughs> Hold on, let me call technology real quick. Yes. Oh my goodness. I'm just glad that you got in, Ms. Jefferson. <laughs> oh, well, glad to be here. Glad to yes, be and here. we thank you. We thank you, thank you, thank you. You may actually, um, there may be some of your classmates on here as well. I don't know. I sent some links out to some people, so we'll find oh, out. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Way to go, Kelly. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot. You're so welcome. I was so excited. <laughs> I was so excited. Now I'm going to have to jump on and off and I'll be back. I, I have I a- um, You double booking yourself. Oh my gosh. Tripled actually. <laughs> People just put stuff on my calendar. You know how that goes. That's okay. So we are recording I this. I know you're a busy And um, just so that you know, because we would like to actually be able to still share it with students that may not be on with us today. Okay. And, um, and I'm sure that Mr. Holler has already kind of chatted with you about what, you know. I told her it's all a surprise. <laughs> 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 well, my, my technology guru is not answering. Uh -oh. Who are you trying to reach? Miss Marcolini. <laughs> oh, well, you know, Mitnick's back in the building. He might be able to help you, maybe. I don't know. Maybe it's because you, you said, Jason, everyone else was not going to be able to have video, right? Yes, no one else has video, just the three of us. But okay. you're a special panelist, so that's why I'm just like, you should be able to. Well, let me let me stop my video and see what happens, if she can come on. So you think it might be just for one person? No, Jason did it to me in particular. <laughs> it's saying it can't start for me. I don't. It says no. the host has stopped it. So is yes. there any is there any way you could hover over my name and activate it? Maybe you the, the, see the three dots on the right hand side. Hover over the three dots. I made you a co-host, so. Uh oh. oh <laughs> no, we have video. <laughs> way to go, Jason. So you didn't need any IT. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was technology savvy. There you go. So, all right. I know it's after 12 and I know we there, I will warn you, there's going to be probably kids popping on, on and off because some of the ones that I, um, that have been told that were told me they were coming today, um, are not on yet. So I'm excited. So welcome to our very first lunch and learn episode work high school style. We're super excited to be introducing people who are representing multiple professions, um, that, are either tied to work high school or tied to someone at work high school. Um, and this just happens to be someone who's tied to our very own um, principal, Dr. Mason. I'm gonna turn it over to you, Dr. Mason, because um, I, I told you I was gonna let you introduce her. So and I, oh I already forewarned her. I forewarned her. No, he did I don't not. Know what he was say. Like 10 he minutes did. ago. What? <laughs> he well, did tell me. <laughs> uh, oh, wow. Well, I'm, I have the. The, the pleasure Aww. of introducing Ms. Karen with the Y Jefferson, who attended UVA <laughs> with me years ago. Wow. And um, she's done some fabulous things in her life. And I had the opportunity to, re to reconnect a few years ago. And so we keep up with each other and we do Zooms and I have some plans of going to visit later on this summer. Prayer. I hope so. I hope yes. so. Yes. <laughs> and um, but what when Mr. Holler and I sat down, I was talking about how do we expose our students to opportunities that exist that they may have absolutely no idea of. Um, and it started last year. Last year, I was just sitting talking to him one day, and and I mentioned that my girlfriend was the assistant. Uh, what was her, what was her title? Because I forgot what it was. Oh my God, it's so sad. What, last year? La not you. Another one of oh, my friends. She girlfriend. was the. Oh my goodness, Mr. Holler, what's the title? What was Dr. Mix's title? Rear, she's a rear admiral. Oh, but she's she, the assistant surgeon general. Thank you. Who, who knew? And we were just <laughs> talking. And so she came in and she kind of she kind of kicked this off. Whereas we're having 
people come in to talk to our students about career opportunities that they would never even think would be out there. So I was talking about you and I'm like, I've got somebody that's in entertainment law as well as you work with um, employment law, correct? Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not going to talk. I'm not that kind of person because it's not about me. It's all about you. Aww. And um, <laughs> I wanted to give you the opportunity to kind of share your journey and how you got there. I also had told Mr. Holler about the other thing that you got to do in your life that I still think is amazing. Yes, um, he knows, he knows. <laughs> <laughs> we can and talk so about that, that. Yes, and so that might be something that the students would like to know about as well. So I'm gonna turn it over to you. And like I said, I got to pop off, but I'll be back. But um, once again, welcome, welcome, welcome to Warwick High School. We are so glad that you're here and Thank I'm you. extremely proud of you. So I just wanted Aww, to share what I'm doing. Proud about. of you as well. Thank you. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Thanks, Dr. Mason. And I, I'm going to try this, Karen. <laughs> I'm yes. trying to be informal here. Um, so um, thank you again for so much for joining us today. And we're super excited to have you on. Um, we're just going to start by kind of like telling, telling us about like a little bit about your background. Where are you from? What you did in high school? What did you go off to college? <laughs> um, and then we'll talk about the more logistics piece of how you got to like practicing law and what other things kind of like took place in your life that made you change directions and have some different, you know, ideas about your future and stuff like that. Okay, so um, I'm from New Jersey, which is where I live now. Um, from Orange, New Jersey, um, I went to school in a, a town nearby called Montclair, um, a Catholic high school. Um, in high school, I actually um, ran track, played basketball, and I played tennis as well. Um, and um, I started off, I know we'll get to kind of the career piece, but I started off very early on in my life knowing that I wanted to be a lawyer. Um, I actually decided that in third grade. Um, and I'll tell you, it's a little personal story as to why, you know, not a great story, but um, my father um, was in a car accident when I was seven years old and he was hit by a tractor trailer, went underneath the tractor trailer. And needless to say, I spent a lot of my childhood growing up in doctor's offices and at lawyer's offices because there was a big lawsuit related to um, the accident. And I remember going with my dad to court and sitting in a courtroom and watching the lawyers interact with each other and the judge and you know calling witnesses to the stand, including my dad. And um, I was like, this is what I want to do. Um, and it just, for me, my entire career thereafter really was like about how I go about getting there. Um, I didn't know what kind of lawyer I wanted to be, but I was really sort of mesmerized by the idea of standing up in a courtroom and, you know, telling a story um, and being able to argue your case. Um, and so um, I actually spent my my law school, my, my high school years just trying to figure out, you know, how I was going to get to become a lawyer. Um, I actually sat in on a session like this where we had actually a lawyer come in on career day, um, my junior and senior year to talk about, um, um, you know, what you needed to do to become a lawyer. Um, and to that end, I asked questions about like what I should major in in, in college, um, what was a good major. And basically, if you're pre-law, you can major in anything. But the one thing that I was told is that you will do a lot of writing and a lot of speaking. And to me, um, majoring in English made sense. Right. So um, I, as Kelly, uh, Dr. Mason already mentioned, I went with her to University of Virginia, which is where we met. Um, and there I majored in, um, I did a double major in English and communications, because obviously as a lawyer, you want to be able to speak well. At some point, I kind of dabbled with the idea of becoming a newscaster. And so I always wanted to make sure that when I spoke, you couldn't necessarily tell where I was from. Um, because I could never figure that out for most news that I saw on television, um, at least in the New York, New Jersey area. Um, and so that became my focus, learning how to write and also making sure, um, you know, that I spoke properly. Um, and so um, finished my major in English and communications. After that, um, I was in, you know, obviously Virginia, um, but decided that I really wanted to come back home. Um, and so I applied and went to ultimately went to law school at Fordham um, in uh, New York City, uh, which is near Lincoln Center. 
And there it became the focus of now that I'm on the road to becoming a lawyer, what kind of lawyer do I want to be? Um, and I was really sort of, um, again, not to use this word multiple times, but mesmerized by the idea of being um, in the entertainment industry. And at one point I decided, okay, I think I want to become an entertainment lawyer for no rhyme or reason. And, and in order to accomplish that while I was in law school, um, I actually interned um, in CBS's uh, legal department. Um, I um, also took entertainment law classes. But after my first year of law school, I got an offer to intern as a summer associate at a law firm in DC called Proskow Rose Getson Mendelssohn at the time. And so I went down to DC for the summer and um, started to work at this law firm. And I actually spent a lot of time with one attorney in particular who until recently with the last administration, he was actually appointed um, the general counsel for what's called the National Labor um, uh, Relations Association, which is the NL, uh, NLRB, I'm sorry, National Labor Relations Board. Um, but um, he had a career in employment and doing labor and employment law. And I spent the summer working with him. He, there was a situation where he was representing a hospital that was undergoing union organization. Um, and he offered me the opportunity to assist him and do training with the uh, members of the hospital. And so I signed on board to do that. And I enjoyed my summer working with him. And after that, I was really intrigued by the idea of doing employment law. And so when I went back to law school for my second year, I started to take employment law classes and, and things of that nature that would just give me a little bit more background. Then my second year, my second summer, after completing my second year of law school, um, I interned with a firm that specialized in labor and employment only here in New Jersey. And there I really got a chance to sort of figure out that this is, this is definitely what I wanna do. Um, it's definitely a job that requires you to be a people person. You interact with people a lot. Um, I actually kind of call um, HR in my world, who is my biggest client, um, sort of the guidance counselors of the workforce, so to speak, or the teachers of the workforce, and, and that I'm their support, um, and that really sort of the workforce is an extension of high school in the sense that you still have the same people, different types of people, um, whether they be people who are aiming to, you know, be um, to do well or may need a little bit of extra help, um, you're still doing the same thing HR is in terms of they may put a person on a performance improvement plan, give them a warning, provide them with direction on how to improve their career or to elevate to another role. And so I really kind of enjoyed that people interaction. Um, and I just decided this was the area that was for me. And so um, luckily, the firm that I worked at after my second year offered me a full-time job when I graduated um, and hence began my career as a labor and employment attorney. Uh, so that's sort of how I got started in, in this particular area, um, which I absolutely love. Um, I'll just say just generally practicing law, if you... there. There's a place in law for everyone, no matter if you are an introvert or an extrovert. Um, I thought I wanted to be an entertainment lawyer, but as I progressed through my law career, I, I saw that that really encompassed primarily reviewing contracts, um, people interaction, but not as much as being an employment lawyer. Um, and I decided that was not for me. Like I, did, I didn't wanna be confined to an office um, interaction. I wanted to be able to get out and, um, you know, I sort of enjoy, like I said, the people interaction and, and that's, and that's really what I get on a day to day in the role that I'm in right now. So I'm going to take it a lot. lot. I'm going to take it back <laughs> a little bit. I'm going to go okay. back. To high school. When you were in high school and you mentioned that, you know, starting in the third grade, you knew this is what you were going to be in high school. How did you go about, so, cause we have our high school students on here. How did you go about preparing to, like I'm, I'm in high school, I'm, I need to focus. What are the focus areas you, that you did in high school to ensure that you knew you were gonna get into college and be, go on to law school? What are the things that you went ahead and prepared for in high school knowing that this is the career option that you wanted to do? Well, I will definitely say that I feel there's a lot more pressure put on students now 
um, than there was back then. I feel like I kind of enjoyed my high school years more so than like my niece <laughs> did, um, who's much younger than I am, simply because um, I was, she was more focused on the grades aspect and everything colleges were taking into consideration in terms of being able to get into a college. And I wasn't necessarily as focused on that. I mean, I knew I wanted to get into college. So obviously getting good grades was important to me, but it was also important to me to be well-rounded. And um, I tried out for the basketball team. I had never played basketball um, prior to high school, um, but I'm, but you can't tell from me sitting down, but I'm five, 10 and a half. And so, you know, I was largely spent most of my, um, you know, school years being the tallest person in my class. And so I was like, my friends were trying out for basketball and I was like, I'm going to try out. And I just put in the effort and turns out at the end of my, my senior year, um, uh, or, or my senior year, I was actually the captain of the basketball team. So I had progressed so well. I started out on junior varsity and switched to varsity. Um, I would just say I was well-rounded in terms of the athletics, right? I already mentioned I played tennis. I ran track as well. Um, but then I also served, I was sophomore um, class president. So I got involved in student council. I was also on the yearbook committee. So it was important to me, but I wasn't really so focused on, I need to do this to get in college. I was more focused on, I want to find things that are of interest to me that are going to enable me to interact with other folks and, and be able to get exposure that way and help me to be a well-rounded person. Um, I also did Girl Scouts most of my, before high school and then up to, whether it's volunteering, um, you know, at various camps where I served as a, a CIT, I think they call it, um, counselor in training. Um, and so I just, um, you know, participating in, in um, various groups at my church, youth groups and things of that nature. And so I think by the time that um, I was ready to go to college, I mean, I was fourth in my class. Um, and I, you know, again, preparing for SATs and, and testing and, and making sure I did well in that regard. Um, I think all of that helped me with respect to getting into UVA. And I think that's so important. You made such a, a strong point that, you know, a lot of students these days are so focused on the academic piece that they lose sight of like the, all the other things that high school has to offer. And then also what colleges want from a student, they just don't want a student who's all necessarily straight academic based. They want students who are well-rounded, have been involved in clubs and activities, who've been involved in sports, who've been involved in community-based activities, because um, that really truly represents what the whole student perspective is. So I'm, so I'm keeping it in high school. So how did you balance how, how did you balance that academic piece and that, that being involved in so much? What was your, what was your kind of balance perspective? Balance, balance. I don't, I don't even think I thought about balance. You just did what you needed to do at the time, right? So, I mean, I was very, I mean, you had, you had your times where you had um, athletics. And so that would take me sometimes into six, seven o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. um, I would come home and then I would just, you know, do my homework. Um, you know, I made sure I made time on the weekends. Um, my parents were always very involved in my schooling, so they would ask questions, they would sit down and actually want to know what I was working on, they would read um, things that, you know, whether it's something I was reading, if they had read it or they would read it along with me, so it was it was definitely family support that I had to be able to, to do what it was that I did. Um, my dad... Um, who I've mentioned previously had been in an accident, he actually was like Mr. Mom in my household. And so he carted me around to all of my basketball games. He went to tennis games with me. And so he was very integral, a part of my high school life as well. And um, my mom who worked would come home and still like assist me. Um, my mom was amazing actually helping me get even through law school when I came back home because I would take notes in class and I would organize them in an outline to study and I would leave them for my mom. And when she came home from work, she would type up my notes for me and, and I would use them then to study. So I definitely had a lot of support from my family. Um, I understand not everybody is fortunate enough to have that. So it's really kind of, you know, just sort of making a schedule and structuring your time and knowing, you know, this, I have this time to allocate to this and understanding what's important. Grades were important to me as well. So I knew I had to make time to be able to get the grades that I needed, understanding that that was going to help me as well with respect to getting into college. 
So now that we're talking, now we're, you segued perfectly to this. So <laughs> we're going, now you're, you're graduated high or you're about to graduate high school. You're in this college planning piece. Um, you know, you want to be a lawyer. How did you go about looking for what college is best for me with the mindset of, I know I want to be a lawyer. I know there's steps to get to that process. how did you go about like thinking about like, how did UVA come on the radar? You're in Jersey. How did UVA get on that radar? Okay. So I will tell you again, taking it back to the fact that I understand right now, I, I, I mean, I've watched a lot of shoes with, shows with the, the documentary on the, the college admission scandal and various things that have been going where there's such pressure either from the parents or from the students place on themselves to be able to get into the right college. Um, I actually did not have that pressure from my parents. Um, neither of my parents had gone away to college. My mom had gone to community college. And so um, I wasn't so focused on sort of this, this idea of I have to go to a certain school the way some students are. Um, to be honest, UVA kind of just fell on my radar, actually. Um, I, being from New Jersey, my first um, uh, inclination was, you know, sort of everybody knows sort of the top schools and there's this desire to go to the top schools when you know what they are. Um, and for me, New Jersey, in New Jersey, it was Princeton. Um, and I, my, my thought was I would apply to Princeton. And then my parents sort of said, you know, you may want to pick another school just in case in New Jersey. They also offered me, I got hit with the, if you stay in New Jersey, you could get a car. But if you travel outside of New Jersey, because the next school on my radar was um, UCLA, because uh, I'd been out, I had family out in California, and my parents were like, don't expect to come home for any holidays, because we are not going to foot the, the flight bill. So I had to think about that, like, oh, I won't see my parents. Um, and so I did, I wanted to be, I have always said to people, I wanted to be far enough that my parents could not just show up. <laughs> <laughs> That was that was my goal. That as long as I could do that, and I knew staying in, in New Jersey. Well, Princeton is a lot farther than where I than where I actually live, but I knew they could drive there and 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 just be at my door at a moment's notice. And then they, like I said, tried to tease me with the idea of a car. Like if you stay, you get the car. Um, but um, so I was considering that. I, I I applied to Princeton. I applied to Rutgers and Seton Hall. I applied to Dartmouth, um, which um, someone had, um, uh, I think as I was going through, I, I got a couple of like scholarships um, in, my, in my last year of high school from various little small, small organizations in New Jersey. And I think someone from that or one of those organizations suggested Dartmouth to me. Um, I actually decided not, to, I took UB, uh, UCLA completely off the radar um, because of, my parents, you know, telling me that they weren't going to have me fly me back and forth. And, um, and I also applied, I'm sorry, to Duke, because I have family in North Carolina. And um, that was sort of a well done. And so I visited all of these schools, went through the process, and I got accepted to all of them waitlisted for Princeton. And, um, and so that kind of was a downer to me, because I think Princeton was probably um, at top of mind. And, and then my guidance counselor suggested after, um, at some point, after reviewing my grades and having a discussion with me, that I might want to consider UVA. UVA, I hadn't even heard of UVA. I didn't know where it was. I hadn't heard of Charlottesville. And so I was like, okay, um, why would I do that? And I remember someone, um, an alumni uh, who was from New Jersey, um, called me just to talk to me about the school and the experience there. And there was a spring fling and it was suggested that I go down to the school to visit. And so, um, and I also then started to, as I, you know, this school came on my radar, started to research it and the whole Thomas Jefferson thing and, and all of that. And just, you know, the history behind the school became very familiar to me. And um, my dad and my aunt drove me down there one weekend uh, to tour the campus. And I just absolutely loved it. Um, and it just, it just seemed right for me. I mean, remember walking the grounds and thinking, this is where I want to go to school. Um, I had, I did know that I wanted to at very least major in English. Um, again, thinking law school and, um, they had a very good program 
there. I remember speaking to individuals in that program. Um, the communications piece actually didn't come onto um, my radar until my first year. Um, and I started to take a couple of communications classes and, and thought that I could um, do a double major. Um, but so I, I applied after that and I got in. And the rest is history. That's how I ended up at UVA with no plans to go there at all. I'm glad you pointed out the fact that like you got that feeling of like you visiting and you get the feeling I tell kids all the time, like, you know, when you know, it's right the feeling that you get. So now you're, you're about to finish UVA. You're looking at what's my next step. So how was the, what is the process of, of, of applying to law school? Um, a lot of our kids, you know, they finish their undergraduate. What's the process that, that you had to undertake to actually now apply? Now you finished your four years. Now what's next? So I actually, um, I did actually apply to UVA's law school and I got waitlisted there again and decided I wasn't going to wait that I, I really did not want to take a year off um, and, and apply again. Um, and so Fordham was actually always on my radar um, just because I had spoken to a couple of people who had gone to Fordham's law school previously, um, but it's the LSATs. So it's kind of like the SATs. So I actually stayed, I remember taking the LSAT course through Kaplan while I was at UVA. And I think, um, I wanna say I was there during, I stayed at UVA during the summer before my last year. Um, and um, took the course then. Um, and then just, uh, I mean, I worked with um, our guidance, our career counseling office um, and, and identified, you know, got the applications and then just went through the process of applying um, at schools. Um, I sort of that, I can't say that I necessarily remember anything else. <laughs> And just excited when I found out I got into Fordham. And, you know, I, I like the idea of being in New York. To me, it was such a contrast to Charlottesville. Um, and um, at the end of the day, I thought in my mind that I saw myself being a lawyer in, in the New York, New Jersey area. So for me, it made sense to go back home in order to start to be able to make those connections while I was in school. Um, and so... Um, yeah, I ended up going back home and and uh, and uh, I actually lived at home and commuted to, to law school um, uh, in New York City. So you finished law school. What do you have to do now to become a lawyer? What do I have to do to become a lawyer? Oh, exhausting. You're, you're traumatizing me now as I think back <laughs> on it. Um, but you got to sit for the bar. Um, it, each state has its own bars. Some states have some reciprocity where you could actually, um, you know, be get admitted into one state and be able to, um, you know, practice in another. Um, and um, there is, uh, so I decided, again, I lived in New Jersey, um, worked, at, go, gone to school in New York. And so I thought, I really should to give myself as much latitude as possible. And I, I make this recommendation to anyone who decides to go to law school and then sit for a bar is try to sit for more than one if you can. And so I sat for New York and New Jersey. It was kind of tough. New York was, I remember New York being first um, and some of my, my fellow students only taking New York and being able to go celebrate after <laughs> we had finished the bar for New York, whereas I had to get, get in my car and drive to South Jersey, I think it was Trenton, to be able to sit for the New Jersey portion of the bar. So I remember it being three days in total, two in New York and one in New Jersey. Um, I know the bar process has changed um, in terms of um, admittance uh, as compared to when I was there. Um, we had, um, so the two days was New York, and then it was this general portion of the bar that would cover multiple states. And so when I went to New Jersey for the third day, I was taking New Jersey's portion, um, which would also then apply to the general, apply with the general portion of the bar that um, I had taken the day prior. Um, I was fortunate in that I actually got admitted into um, both states, um, which was, woohoo. 
<laughs> a little scary there. Um, but um, as similar to kind of doing the LSATs, I actually took a course through, um, I don't know if it was Kaplan, um, but it was similar that offered a course. And I spent a, my, um, basically my summer after I graduated from law school studying for the bar. Um, the course was probably um, a month or so long. Um, and, um, and we met every day. Um, and then when I wasn't um, studying for the, you know, in class, I was supposed to be studying for the bar. <laughs> supposed to be. <laughs> um, not always did that. I don't recommend that to anyone, but um, I did a kind of a cram session. I probably saw more of New York City during that summer than I, than I should have, but I still passed. So that, that's all that matters in the end. But uh, yeah, so then you're just sort of waiting. What happens is you, you take the bar. I was fortunate, like I said previously, to have a job already lined up for me that started in September. So I graduated in May, studied all summer. Um, you basically, you, I think I took the bar at, at the end of July. So then I had the month of August off um, and then started my new job in September. And so you're starting a new job and you're actually kind of um, practicing law um, without, you know, under someone's direction where you, you're waiting to actually find out if you passed. And so I think I may have got noticed that I passed the bar maybe in late October, early November of that year. And then after you pass the bar, you have to go through the process of applying for admittance and, and um, being sworn in in the particular state. So I initially did it just in New Jersey because my job was in New Jersey and I just let the New York um, one sit. Um, I worked at the firm in New Jersey for two years after, a little over about two and a half years after I graduated before I took a position at a law firm in New York City. And as a result of that um, job, I needed to actually go through the process of formally getting admitted and sworn in in um, New York. And so that's when I did it then. Awesome. I feel like I owe you something for bringing back such traumatizing <laughs> Yeah, sitting for the bar is not a fun experience, but I'm sure sitting for the SATs or any state exam is 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 very similar. I'll, um, I'll, I'll put that on Dr. Mason's bill. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned in the fact that you, um, I don't know if it, you interned with some law firms while you were in law school. Yes. For, what what how what did that do for you? How did that help you? Again, I'm sure it helped me make connections. And I know I think one of them hired you at the end. Mm -hmm. What was how beneficial was that when you're in law school interning with other law with a law firms? Well, you can all you don't have first of all, you don't have to do a law firm. Some okay. people clerked. You okay. could actually go um, you know, work for the courts under a judge. Um, some people did something like that in the court system. Other people may have been fortunate enough to find in-house opportunities. Like I said, while I was actually in law school and I was taking entertainment law um, as a course, a component of that was actually interning in CBS's law department. And so that was an interesting experience for me. So I'm in-house. So there's, there's various types of lawyers. Law, there's lawyers that are, are advocates for a company, which is what I am currently, where they work for a company. And that's, all they, that's the only entity they work for. Um, they advocate, they provide advice and counsel, review contracts, and, and do everything just for that entity. Then there's lawyers that work at law firms um, where they're servicing multiple clients on behalf of the law firm. Um, and so there's a lot of opportunities to have interaction with a lot of different entities. Like, you know, I've, I've worked for, a, when I've been at a law firm, I've worked for retail companies, um, you know, manufacturing, um, uh, anything in the science industry, health services, um, it, it runs the gamut, entertainment as well. Um, and then there's lawyers that that work for the court, so they could be prosecutors or um, attorney, uh, prosecutors where they're working for this the state. Um, and there's lawyers that have their own law practice. So there's definitely various categories. And so you can intern basically in any of those ca categories while you're in law school. And so we you can you complete your first year of law school, and then the goal is to prior to that completion to have a job lined up for the summer in any of the categories or, or beyond that I've mentioned. 
And that is supposed to give you an opportunity to sort of um, be able to test the waters and see what's of interest to you. What do you like? What do you don't like? Where you might want to focus, right? And so during that summer, like I said, I worked at a law firm in, in DC. And I would say that particular opportunity um, after my first year of law school is the reason why I do what I do now. Um, the, the attorney, Peter Robb is his name, amazing guy, just really just had such an impact on me. I don't even know if he knows that, <laughs> um, uh, you know, with respect to my desire to do employment law. And so um, then after your second year, you complete your second year of law school, but before you complete, again, the, the goal is to have another opportunity. Maybe it's the same one, if you're lucky or not, but another opportunity to be able to um, uh, work in a legal field um, that might be of interest to you. And then sort of you come back to school, you complete your third year, and the goal is to have a job lined up before you graduate. Um, and how it worked at Fordham is they had this whole um, week to two weeks of interviewing um, where, um, you know, firms would come in and we all look like <laughs> everybody's in a suit, you know, um, usually blue or black um, was the colors back in the day. No one really deviated from that. We all look like clones. And you had um, uh, interviews lined up with various law firms throughout the metropolitan area, New York, New Jersey, um, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, um, that were coming in to actually interview students for jobs after um, they graduated from law school. And that's kind of how the process worked. But as you mentioned, my second year, I got a, a job at a law firm locally in New Jersey. Um, and it was a great experience working for them over the summer, such that um, not only did they offer me a job after I graduated, but they had a New York office. And so I actually spent my third year of law school working in their New York office um, as well as going to school. And then when I um, completed my uh, studying for the bar and taking the bar, I then started permanently with them in that September of that year that I graduated. Awesome. So I'm a it's a exhausting yeah, process. <laughs> Dr. Rachel alluded to this a little bit ago when she first introduced you. I know you faced a lot of challenges and the legal, the law, um, the profession of law, it can be very overwhelming and stuff like that. So what are some of the challenges that you faced? And then what is some of the awesome opportunities that you had to do outside possibly uh, <laughs> <laughs> that you were able okay. to, um, to do? And I love your story that you were telling me earlier, how like that kind of changed your mindset of everything. Okay, so challenges. Um, like I said, I think the practice of law is a lot different. Um, I will share, I'm going to date myself here, say I graduated from law school in 1995. Um, and when I, so my first job, like I said, was working at a firm in New York, I mean, in New Jersey. Um, and I guess I really am glad that I actually majored in English um, used to doing a lot of writing. Um, I probably wish I had more writing courses that I had taken in law school, but I don't know that that necessarily would have helped me in that, um, you, I found myself needing to learn to write for whomever I was working on something for. Um, the various partners is what you call them at law firms. And I'm, as a new attorney, I'm an associate. Um, I was assigned to work with various different part partners who had different writing styles. Um, you know, being able, learning how to research um, legal cases. Um, you know, we had Lexis, there's a legal platform called LexisNexis. And then there's also Westlaw, um, which um, have developed tremendously since I was in law school. I remember going in um, and having to do assignments and combing the stacks of the legal library um, to be able to find cases and things of that nature. Whereas now people can just easily, um, you know, type in a password online and go into a platform and be able to print the cases out. Um, so definitely a different experience. Um, and so learning how to research, learning how to write, just because you know how to sort of um, 
write something for a particular course, it's a lot different when you're writing, for example, a memo um, to a client or to a partner at a law firm, um, sort of laying out the legal arguments related to something versus actually putting it in a brief to actually um, to file it in court. Um, there are certain ways that cases need to be cited. And so what are you looking at, Jason? <laughs> you seem um, focused. Um, What's Ken going on? Roger Mason's friend is in my office now. Sorry. Oh! oh! <laughs> Hello! <laughs> Sorry. Sorry no, that. it's okay. It's okay. But yeah, so just, just trying to adjust in terms of writing and research. Um, the other thing I really had to get used to, despite being a communications major and, and having opportunities to speak, I actually, while I was in law school, there's various organizations that you may want to consider joining. Um, there's, people have, may have heard of Law Review, um, or there's various journals. I was on an urban law journal where each um, semester we would publish this book with various topics and articles in it. Um, but they also have moot court where it's essentially an opportunity to kind of play attorney, judge, and, and, and jury all in one setting, and you get a set of facts and you have to argue them. And so I was on our, I was on the moot court board. And so I say all that to say that kind of helped me with speaking in public. Um, there's a difference between you and I just having a conversation here as we are now, and then having to stand up in front of a judge and argue um, various points or arguments. And so um, had to learn how to do that. And that was a challenge. Um, and I will share with you that even after practicing law for 10 years, I actually have taken, I always try to kind of just try something new whenever possible, right? Um, but there's actually this woman in New York who teaches, she's an acting coach and she actually does a course for lawyers. Um, and a wow. lot of it, um, not seeing it too much in the trials that are playing out now that we know about on television, is a lot of how you sort of uh, carry yourself, your demeanor, how you speak. It, and then some of it can be um, a little bit of acting that, that goes into it. And so she sort of takes lawyers through this process of being able to speak. So that's a challenge, but there's various resources out there for those who aren't used to talking um, or don't want to, you don't have to be a lawyer that goes to court. But I actually, a part of my job is I did um, litigation. So I've actually spent a lot of time in a courtroom before a judge. And so, um, you know, Luckily, you usually start off your career second chairing or following another attorney into the courtroom and being able to understand sort of what is the proper decorum. And, um, you know, obviously, you know, when everybody, I think, knows that when the judge comes in, everybody's supposed to rise and, you know, just little things like that, just learning those nuances and just following behind and being able to be mentored by various um, more experienced attorneys at law firms sort of help me with things of that nature. Um, I've learned, which you'll probably figure out more so in college, right? Late nights, <laughs> spent many a late night, whether it's studying, trying to finish a paper or do something, um, did a lot of that in law school as well, which definitely prepared me for the working world. And when I started out, um, at my firm in New York, um, I was working 60 plus hours a week, easy. Um, and it was back in the day of car service, meals in the office paid for by the client. Um, and literally, I would take a car home just so I could get changed and come back to work sometimes. And um, the, it was just mentally sometimes and physically exhausting. Um, and I'm going to use that to segue into. <laughs> so I was at my, my um, firm in, um, in New York. Um, and um, pretty much getting burnt out from, from practicing law. And um, I had a situation, you know, the one thing that you have to keep in mind in your career is life just throws things at you and you just have to be able to dodge. So you may have a plan, a course of action as to how you want to do things. I think at one point I thought I want to be a partner at a law firm in New York and that's my goal. Um, but you sort of listen to the universe. And, and so I had a situation in, in um, while working at a firm in New York where unexpectedly I had um, 
uh, experienced appendicitis. It was a horrible situation. I'm not going to go into detail, but it was just horrible. They didn't know I had it. And, and anyway, I had to get my appendix removed and spent some time on my parents' couch with them taking care of me. And, I, and I, that was a moment of reflection for me where I was like, why am I working these ridiculous hours? Um, I really need a break from practicing law. Would love to be able to do something different, but had no clue what that would be. And, um, but I was so driven by it um, how I felt about the situation that when I recovered, I walked into the partner's office of, of my law firm in New York and I was like, I quit. And he was like, completely caught off guard. What, why, what's going on? I was just like, I just can't do this anymore. I need a break. I don't know what I want to do, but I'll figure it out. Um, luckily, you know, you never know. Again, the universe throws things at you. The partner was great about it. He was like, you don't have a job. He was like, stay on. We'll get you a career coach. Um, we'll cut back on your hours and you could figure out what it is that you want to do. And so that's what I ended up doing. And I, so I had a lot of downtime <laughs> at work. And one day I got on CB, I thought maybe I want to do something completely unrelated to law. And at the time Survivor was out. And so I was like, I'm going to audition for Survivor. That's what I'm going to do. So I got on CBS's website to look for the application for Survivor. And instead, I saw this advertisement. Again, I just say the universe is just speaking to me, right? Instead, I see an advertisement for a website, called, I mean, a, a show called Race Around the World is what they were calling it. And I read it and it said, you'll be traveling to different places and you won't know and performing different tasks. And, you know, it's a team of two people traveling the globe. And I was like, that's more my speed. Like, why would I want to stay in an, on an island somewhere when I can see the world? And I will share with you before I, again, wherever you can get fun in things and do something that's important to you, take time to do it. So I, I worked, I studied for the bar after I graduated from law school. And then I spent a month, my girlfriend and I both bought round trip tickets to Paris. And we literally just backpacked through Europe for a month before I started my job in, in uh, September. And so I sort of developed this love of travel from having done that. And so this was just right in my lane in terms of being able. So I, to make a long story short, um, I auditioned for um, the Race Around the World show with my then boyfriend at the time. And after a whole interview process of two to three months, we were ultimately selected to be contestants on the first season of what later became known as The Amazing Race which is still on TV today. And it's a race around the world for a million dollars. So I was actually on the first season. Um, and that was a great experience, made it halfway around the world, started off in Central Park and got eliminated in India at the Taj Mahal. Um, and um, just, uh, I found myself doing things that I, I never thought I would do. And so like I jumped off a 580 foot cliff in in Africa and um cabled across um you know a ravine of, of a similar length and um I've been in the sewer in Paris and I've ridden a camel through the Sahara desert and um it's just been a, it was a great experience um uh, it was completely different um and I thoroughly enjoyed it um, needless to say, we did not win the million dollars, but we did, they did have staggered payments that they gave to contestants. And um, I used my winnings. I came back and after I slept for probably a month <laughs> to recover, because I was so exhausted having not slept during the show, um, I decided that I wanted to start my own law practice, that I, I, I had been practicing law at that point for five years. And I felt that I had garnered enough experience that I could actually tackle it on my own. And I had a client, um, a rather large client um, that I was uh, that I had brought in at my last law firm. And so I went to them and I asked them if they would be willing to give me additional work and that I wanted to start my own practice. And they said, sure. And so I used my earnings or winnings from the show to start to open up an office to, to go towards my computer equipment, my furniture and everything. And, um, and then I started my own practice, Karen D. Jefferson LLC, um, where I did employment work for largely for various companies up until um, 2014 when I took a job in-house 
Uh, so working for a company and that company was Benjamin Moore at the time. Um, I am currently now, um, I left Benjamin, Benjamin Moore last year, um, and I'm currently working for a company called Urban One Inc., which is the largest um, Black-owned multimedia company in the country. Um, they own, um, there's a cable component, um, they own TV One, which is a channel, a cable channel. Um, they also own um they have Radio One, uh, which is various radio stations that they have in different markets throughout the country. And then they also have a digital market where they own various websites, including like you might have heard of like Boss Up, maybe a lot of urban um, uh, websites that they own. And so um, I, that's where I'm employed right now as their in-house employment council. So what's a day in the life? What's a day in the life of Karen <laughs> right now in this new job? Well, it's definitely a day in the life of a pandemic, <laughs> Karen, because I right now, as you can see, I'm in my ho I'm in my home office right now. This is not where I would be. I would expect to be that the office, even though the corporate headquarters for the company is in Maryland, um, I um, they have an office in New York City, which is where I'm supposed to be working out of. So now every day I get dressed and I, I come to my desk in my office. Um, but it's really just a mixture of things throughout the day. So I, in my role as employment counsel, um, what I do is I support human resources and they could have everything. So anything that has to do with employees falls within the gamut of what I could be responsible for or asked to assist on. And that's everything. If an employee complains of discrimination in the workplace, um, I would work with HR to address a situation like that. Um, if an employee has a um, disability, a medical condition, a surgery that's planned, um, and they need time off of work, um, uh, there, there are various leaves that exist, both at the federal and state le level, some, such as something called the Family Medical Leave Act. So I would work with HR to ensure that that person got the proper leave, um, work with HR when they get ready to return to work, um, to ensure that we are complying with the law with respect to that individual. I provide day-to-day -day counseling on everything from performance evaluations that are being issued, written warnings, verbal warnings issued to employees, um, whether or not um, they receive a severance package, if their job is eliminated and they're leaving the company, my responsibility is to draft those severance packages. Um, I also draft employment agreements. So certain individuals within the company have um, have an agreement which governs. So just so you know, when you get a job uh, or if you have a job, your employment is generally at will, which means that a company can terminate you at any time for any reason or no reason at all. However, some people have employment agreements that guarantee them employment for a specific period of time. And so I'm responsible for, in those instances, drafting those agreements for those individuals, which governs the terms and conditions of their employment. Um, I am really busy right now in the COVID world um, because there's so many COVID related questions that are out there. Um, right now, it's like, you know, are we going to require employees to get vaccinated before they return to work? Um, for those who don't get vaccinated or whether or not they are, are we going to have daily screening questions to have them return to the office? And are we going to check their temperature? Are we going to ask them if they've come in contact with someone who has COVID? If someone enters the workplace and they have COVID, um, how are we contacting, contact tracing, con, you know, contacting their coworkers, making sure we clean the facility. I'm involved in, in that entire process. And right now at my company, the majority of people are working remotely from home. And so we're trying to put together a phased approach to returning to the office. And I'm responsible for working with a team that actually assists. And there's legal components of that, right? Because various states are passing laws related to whether or not you can require a vaccination, what you have to do in order for people to return to work, what is the occupancy in terms of capacity, in terms of how many people can be in the, in the workplace at a given period of time. So um, COVID has definitely become a, um, a heavy portion of what I do on a day-to-day. Um, I work with our insurance carriers. Um, you know, I'm responsible for things like workers comp. So usually if an employee gets injured in the workplace, their injury is governed by workers comp insurance and they get workers compensation benefits for being out of work due to that injury. And so I'm responsible for overseeing things like that. Um, companies can 
regularly get lawsuits or subpoenas for information, whether it's personal records of an existing or former employee, um, those subpoenas come to me. Um, I'm responsible for, for responding to them, responsible for um, handling any litigation that the company has. Um, and um, usually re that entails retaining outside counsel. That means an attorney at a law firm to actually represent the company and then overseeing everything that that attorney does. Um, I draft policies um, from behalf of the company re that's related to employees, um, that can include employee handbooks, um, as well. Um, and I think that pretty much covers, I probably could go on a little bit more, but that's basically the bulk of what a day is for me. I spend a lot of time on the phone because a lot of people just have questions and by people, it could be a manager. It could be, um, someone in human resources that wants to run things by me, um, before they do something. And, um, and then like a lot of time, also bulk time, just writing documents and creating documents for um, the various uh, business partners that I support. That seems like a busy day. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very long day too. It's, I think it's probably longer for a lot of people now with the pandemic, just because you know we're home and it's just easy for me to just sit here at my desk a lot longer <laughs> than I would if I was in the office and I actually needed to drive or take, you know, public transportation home. So it's a longer day. So we do have a couple questions. I know we're almost at that time. Okay. Um, so one person, Vanessa asked, what was the cost? And I'm assuming she was asking the cost of both your undergraduate and potentially your going into law school. I know things have changed a little bit. <laughs> okay. So I want to say the one thing... Uh, the one thing I will mention with respect to college is that um, obviously going to Virginia, I was an out-of-stater. Um, but the one thing that you know you can do when you get into college is find opportunities to be able to um, again, if you're if you're great at managing your time. Um, like you asked me previously in high school, you need to be able to do that in college as well. Um, I actually. Um, I, I remember graduating at UVA and um, receiving a, what's called a faculty cup award from my communications major uh, professors. And um, the professor joked as he was, I didn't even know I was getting this award, um, as he was talking about me that she has more jobs than anyone that I've ever <laughs> encountered. Um, and she has has just as many hats. So my, my thing in college was I used to wear these hats, all the different hats all the time. And I say all that to say is I got to college and I think my first semester at UVA, I want to say was something around eleven or twelve thousand dollars, which I guess today doesn't seem like much, right? For for the first semester, for one semester. I pay tuition now. <laughs> But I will tell you, my, my first year of college, I got a job waitressing. And so I, that gave me extra money through, through my first year. Um, I considered, one of my friends tried to talk me into um, being a walk-on on the women's basketball team. Now, any of you who know basketball, I actually went to school with Dawn Staley, who is the head coach of women's basketball at South Carolina. She is a basketball player. Remember, as I told you previously, I didn't play basketball before going to high school. So while I thought I had gotten better in my four years in high school, I did not think I was anywhere near being able to play at a Dawn Staley caliber. So my friend who tried to talk me into it, I said, no, I'm not going to try out, but I will definitely support you if you do. And she did. Um, and um, as a result of my working with her and supporting her, I got to know the women's basketball team. And I ultimately ended up applying to be a manager for the women's basketball team. And I did not know this, but being a manager entitled me to the extent there were uh, scholarships left over to be able to have access to money to, to pay for my schooling. Kelly's looking at me like, I didn't know you got that. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so what, what the women's basketball team is, there were four managers on the team, um, is they divvied up, I think, two to three scholarships that they had left where they, they did not have team, um, team members uh, to, to provide it to. And 
they gave us that money to go towards um, our tuition. And so I got a discount as being a manager, which I did through the rest of my, through my second, third and, and, la- and fourth year at UVA. So that helped as well. Um, I also, once I was able to, cause UVA your first year, you couldn't have a car. Um, I did ultimately talk my parents into finally getting me a car, um, which then gave me the opportunity. I babysat and tutored um, actually um, someone who was in junior high. So I would pick her up from school, I would tutor her. And so I had a job doing that. Um, I also worked as um, uh, a data entry clerk in the music department where I had to type up notes um, from various music selections um, into a computer. And so I, I did that as well. And I probably have a few other jobs out there, but it was always like, I was either late for one of my classes. My professors all knew what I did. I was either late or I had to leave early because I had to go pick, you know, one of my, um, the student that I picked up from school and tutored, I had to pick her up. So they were always teasing me about how I was always like working. Um, But needless to say, all of that work contributed contributed to lowering my um, tuition. That being said, I want to say I nevertheless graduated from UVA about $40,000 or so in debt. Um, and, and so I think um, Kelly, Dr. Mason can probably answer. Oh, she was in state. I'm sorry. She didn't have to pay out as much money as I did to go to UVA. But I think it, <laughs> it increased after that. I want to say per semester, it then was like 15 or so each semester um, as out of state. Um, And then I want to say at um, Fordham, it was about $20,000 each semester. Oh, my. So when you worked at the basketball team, you worked under Coach Debbie Ryan, didn't you? I sure did. I sure did. I lived in Charlottesville. um, And I saw Dawn Staley play. Oh! I was was still a young spurt. It was in high school. (laughs) Well, no, either, might have been elementary school. school. I was in elementary school. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> oh so, yes. Um, one more question. Trava Boone asks: Is philosophy a good major to choose for my bachelor's degree if I want to go to law school? Okay, so I will tell you what I was told, and I think still remains true today. You can major in anything and go to law school. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I was not. It, I just fell into English to me because I enjoyed English. I love Shakespeare. And, and so that was like my, my, I got addicted to that in high school. Um, and um, and uh, I love the writing piece and I knew I was gonna do a lot of that. And so that was where my mindset was. But there are people that um, have majored, gone, intended to go to medical school and then decided they wanted to be a lawyer. Um, it doesn't matter. So philosophy, I, I definitely know um, some of my colleagues who, who that was their major, um, who are now lawyers, certainly doable. Awesome. Well, Karen, I cannot thank you enough. Truly. First of all, it was, it was awesome to meet you. It's awesome <laughs> Same to meet, here, Jason. It's always awesome to meet people that Dr. Mason know. Um, we'll talk about <laughs> I, my, I, want, I want some stories. <laughs> so <crazy. laughs> He is such a nut. <laughs> um, but I can't think. Nothing, it's, it's, Cal, Dr. Mason was was good in at UVA. There are there are Thank folks you. that when I see them now, oh, I, I if I have flashbacks to what they were like in in college. <laughs> I have nothing but good things to say. She never did anything in my presence that I have any stories, unfortunately, Jason, to tell you about her. I really <laughs> don't. She was, she was a goody two shoes. I'm sure she still is, but. <laughs> and you know what? That's what they called me when I first moved here. They were like, you're such a goody two shoes. Nobody even knew what you were doing. That's right. <laughs> you won't believe that. <laughs> But, yeah. but I can't thank you enough. I really do appreciate oh. you for doing this. And I, my hope is that, you know, some of my students will hear something that will really be like, oh, wow, I didn't realize that I could do all of those things because you've done a lot. Yeah. And I learned a lot myself about you today that I'm like, wow. So I'm looking forward to this summer and getting up there to visit. So, okay. Yeah, I mean, if anything, takeaway um, from it is, you know, create direction for yourself. There's nothing wrong with having direction and understanding where you want to be and what you want to do in life, but be open to the possibilities and other things that may come your way because it may lead to something even better, you know? So I, I have no regrets for taking a break. Like I took a year and a half off total 
from practicing law. Um, I traveled, I actually um, went to go live with a family in Costa Rica and I took Spanish classes. Um, you know, do something different. Um, you know, create a list for yourself of things you want to do. Um, and then be open to kind of deviating here and there. You can always get back on track. And, you know, there's some people that, I mean, I remember after I did the amazing race, coming back home and going to lunch with some of my friends who were attorneys at law firms in New York, we met for lunch and, you know, they, they were like, we so envy you and the fact that you're, you're not working, like you're taking a break. Like, it was like, I wish I could do that, but I now have a mortgage. I have like tuition for kids. And, and so it, they kind of were boxed into that particular opportunity. So, you know, if you have the chance to kind of do stuff before you, um, for lack of a better phrase, become an adult, you know, and really have to adult because, you know, adulting is bills and it's like, you know, this constant structure and things be a little free spirited wherever you can and, and get it in. And even if you can do it as an adult, you know, try to make time, um, you know, as if anything we've learned from this pandemic is life is short yeah. and we need to make the most of it and go visit that person that you've been delaying visiting, go explore that opportunity or that, you know, country that you talked about going to, but didn't make time for your career will be there be there and there's yeah, always an opportunity uh, to make connections I know. you hear that mr hall he's working on his doctorate right now oh. and so i've got two people on my team working on their doctorate and it's hilarious but i'm like guess what you're gonna get through this and then you're gonna be like oh my man you because you learn you're gonna learn a lot about yourself as you go through that process so mm -hmm. but anyway yep. i didn't mean i wasn't trying to steal your shine no no no, no. With lie. So, <laughs> but anyway <laughs> but again thank you so but much. i love you bunches thank you again yeah. Yes. Sure. And I hope we're, we'll be in contact again sometime soon. Jason, you have my number. You're welcome to reach out to me anytime. <laughs> Seriously. I'll just come to, I'll come with Dr. Mason to New York. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a plan. You oh, got it. You got that. it. <laughs> All right. Thanks everybody. All right, everybody. Have a great day. All Take right, care. Bye. <laughs>